Welcome home. This is the Irish Roots Cafe, where every day's a holiday, and there's always room for one more. Come right this way. Have a seat with me today in the corner booth, celebrating episode number 128. Sweeney, clear the floor. Katie, bar the door. Molly, put on another pot of Irish coffee and bring out the Irish dancers. It's time we get this show on the road. Another full house today, not a chair to spare. I'm Michael Laughlin, your host, and you can reach me on my webpage at irishroots.com. And be sure to check out the written show notes on my blog. We've got a lot of good links there. And on my webpage, you can also uh, search our books and search our videos and... uh, you know, you can even uh, uh, turn around, pick up the phone, and call me at 816-256-3360 and leave a message on my recorder. Try it, you'll like it. Among today's topics, Hinnigan or Hinnahan is the Irish family name of the day, the rise of Brian Baru, High King, the top free and paid attractions in Ireland, the Irish and Jews in concert in the U.S., Irish superstitions, Coca-Cola outsells milk, and 17th century census of Ireland. Well, now it's time to uh, take a look at the notes this week and see what's been happening here at the cafe. Well, let me see. I guess first up on here will be the... uh, The question I got on Twitter, I was on Twitter, and Roseanne there, uh, uh, she asked me about Brian Baru, if I knew anything about it, and, uh, you know, I thought that's a good topic, so Peter and I on our uh, Irish history questions and answers and discourses, we're going to add that to our new podcast series and make that one of the topics, uh, because it sure deserves uh, talking about, and there's a lot to learn. Uh, so we're going to do a full podcast on B- Brian Baru, and he's the guy that they said uh, during his reign, uh, he declared that surnames be used, or maybe it was that they just started to become more prominent at that time. And uh, you know that ancient tribe that became the O'Briens of County Clare? They were the Dalcasians, and they moved up. Uh, they came from down south a little bit before they moved up to up there in uh, Thoman. And... Uh, some people say, especially the writers of the O'Brien history, uh, uh, they say that the O'Briens were one of the people that were entitled to rule from Cashel with the kings of Cashel. Other people say they're not so sure. They think Brian might have just taken over the kingship and written them into history books as if they were uh, entitled to the throne. But they're known as the Dalcassians, and sometimes you'll see them spelled out as D-A-L-G, then a capital C, and then an A-S. Uh, uh, you'll see that a lot of times when looking at uh, some of these old books with these old pedigrees and the history of the tribes. And uh, gosh, I think it was his grandfather was Lorcan, and he had a- achieved a kingship, I think, in North Munster. And his father uh, fought uh, quite a bit against the Vikings and... Uh, they say he was slain through treachery, and then his brother ex- assumed a local kingship as well. But he was betrayed after he accepted an offer uh, to have dinner at a rival chieftain's uh, castle, I think it was, or household. And uh, they put him to the sword there. So that was another story written by the uh, O'Brien. So you don't know what might really have happened. But Brian Baru, known as Brian of the Tributes, He rose to the throne and became uh, what they say was the last high king of Ireland. He defeated the Vikings in the Great Battle of Clontarf, which most people know about over there by Dublin. And he was slain at that battle or just after it uh, while he was at his tent, and that was in the year 1014. And you have to remember, even though he's given the credit for breaking the power or driving the Vikings out of Ireland at that time, He had Vikings uh, fighting with him and fighting against him, and uh, they had allied themselves with certain groups of the Vikings to fight against others. So it sort of seems like the Vikings were just another clan there that uh, were referred to as foreigners when you wanted to go after them. Uh, But boy, there's a whole story there, and it encompasses the Vikings and 
it really takes you all the way up to the Norman invasions and uh, what a drastic change for Ireland that was. So I just thought I'd give you a little, few little hints there and let you know that we're, uh, we're working on that topic right now and we'll have it coming up. Uh, number two, we just, we've just we got the audio version of Missouri Irish all recorded and now I've edited it just fine. It took a lot of time to edit that. Uh, you got to listen to these things two or three times so that means two or three or more hours for every hour I recorded. But it's done now, and now we're trying to figure out the best way for putting it on the web and the best way to uh, uh, also make it available on uh, disc for the first time. So that's been real interesting. Uh, and like I said, Peter Adams and I have been recording chapters for our upcoming Irish History broadcast and the audio book. So not only look for that later this year, but if you've got a question about Irish history that you like to see uh, expounded upon... Let me know now. I'll put it right on that list, and it'll be like a custom show just for you, and a, particularly for members. If you've got something we want to cover, we'll do our best to uh, inform you what the story is. And uh, that just about does it for what's going on around here. We've had a uh, we've had a real good week and a lot of good Irish music, and uh, went to a session this afternoon with all those traditional musicians. So it was just fine. Uh, now I think we're going to move on to the Books of the Month. Well, let me see. We're going to make the uh, Book of the Month. We're going to say it's the Irish Census of 1659. I've got a link to that on the blog. Okay, and we also have a... Uh, uh, before I get into that, I just saw a video of the day, put it on Twitter as uh, one of my favorites, and it, it's really about, uh, it, it's a specific excerpt, a reenactment on Irish that settled in Canada, talking about the children of the immigrants who died and during the great famine of all the hunger and disease, and uh, they were being adopted by uh, native families and uh, who spoke another uh, language, and as they are adopted, they're going to change their names to their new names, to their new Canadian names. And the kids say, no, please, please. My mother made us promise as she lay dying that we keep our Irish name as a memory of the country we came from. And they, uh, in this case, they let them keep it. But I've got a link to that video on my blog. It's well worth taking a look at. Now we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, Finding Your Family in the 1659 Census, and this is part six of a 10-part series I put together just to sort of uh, acquaint some people with some basics uh, in genealogy that they may or may not know, especially for the beginners. And I've put together a lot of different simple little indexes over the last uh, 30 years, really. And here's one that I think bears looking at, and some people don't really don't pay any attention to it until later in their, in their research, but... Uh, it really is a very quick location finder for Irish families and Irish family names, like uh, where was my family located? Not just the county, but for Irish names, you can find what barony within the county your family was centered in. And you can look and see, well, in this there are 90% of my family name was in this barony. So if I ever start looking, I have some spare time, maybe my American research is going a little slow and I might be uh, dragging a bit. It could be an exciting little thing to take a look, figure out how your name was spelled in the 17th century, and then go right on ahead and see which baronies and which counties your name was found in at that time. And if you're lucky, you might even get more than just a surname and a barony, uh, especially for the, uh, uh, the settlers or the overlord type of folks. Uh, they'll have first and last names listed there. And uh, so you don't know what quite you'll find, but it's well worth your time. And uh, it tells you a little bit about how things were divvied up in that century, too. Uh, and even if you've not found your family location in Ireland yet, you can start to research where your family name was found at that time. And then you can come on down and look at the 1890 birth index and see just where your family was located then. So it's a helpful thing. And most, most families didn't move. They're still centered in the same counties, in the same baronies, not 100%, but a lot, so the odds are in your favor. Now, if we take a look at that 1659 census, the extract that I've uh, uh, printed up, I've got on my website, 
Uh, it's a special report where it lists every surname under each spelling that it was given in that census and uh, the counties within which they were found. And it also includes something they call the poll money ordinance papers of 1660-1661. So it's a good little uh, identifier for where you might find some more information on your family name. And uh, the original documents hold even more information, but this is the heart of the matter that we show here. And uh, on, this, on the census itself, the census says how many Scots and English settlers were there. And uh, you, you can see real quickly that the Scots are found widespread in the province of Ulster, up north in Ireland, uh, with the exception of Monaghan and most of County Antrim, where... Only the barony of Glen Arm shows Scots settlement at that time. Uh, now, people talk about Scots or English, and you're, it's a little hard to determine sometimes really what they're saying. It might refer to those who use the language, the Scots language or the English language, or it could refer to those who have just recently come to Ireland as opposed to second or th third generation folks. Uh, and Scottish settlement is also shown in... Uh, in the barony of Lower Ormond in Tipperary and in the barony of Grenard in Longford. Uh, just to give you an idea of what might turn up to you, especially if you were a, a Scots-Irish family. And uh, there was only one uh, barony, Coolavin barony in, barony in County Sligo, that showed there were no English settlers at all, which is a rare thing. Uh, now, it shows no Scotch settlers in the provinces of Munster or Connacht, where the Irish outnumbered the English by a ratio of 10 to 1. And, of course, in uh, Ulster, it was a whole different story. The ratio was one and one half Irishman to every uh, Englishman or Scotsman. And in uh, uh, the province of Leinster, it was five and a half Irishman to every one English or Scots. And uh, the fellow that put this together estimated that the overall ratio was five to one, but he suggests that it might have been seven Irish to one settler family total in reality. Now, uh, W.H. Harding announced discovery of the 1659 census in 1864, and he thought it was compiled in 1654 to 1659 by uh, Petty during his well-known survey. And uh, that civil survey preceded this survey by a few years. And it might have been a preliminary survey for the better work to follow. We know, we're not really sure. And uh, you've got an emphasis on things like the number of English, Scots, and Irish people in the area and the principal names of the Irish families in each area. So that's another clue to look at. Now, at that time, Harding said the estimated population uh, was about 500,000 based upon that census. But, you know, Tom's Almanac uh, gives us a figure of like 1.3 million, so they're really guessing. Now, you have to remember that we don't have every county in this census. Uh, you know, we're missing Cavan, Galway, Mayo, Tyrone, uh, and Wicklow. And uh, four baronies are missing in Cork, and nine baronies are missing in Meath. So the rest of the country they got down, but those are the missing areas. Uh now, remember, like I said, remember that 17th century spelling can surely be different than the way you spell the name today. So be sure to look at our variant spelling indexes or consult them yourself or do a little thinking about it. And uh, remember that Mac, Mick, Fitz, and old prefix can appear or disappear at times during your research. So check it both ways when you take a look at that census or any census, especially if you're having a problem. Well, you know what time it is now? It's time to raise our eyes skyward, give thanks, and ask for help. Help, help, help. Here are today's Magnificent Seven. Number one, uh, welcome Cindy Marie Johnson, new member. Uh, O'Keefe family, Duhalo, Cork. Up to 40 O'Keefe's transported to Australia for subversion from 1802 onwards. And she has the transportation records uh, here in Oz, is what she says. But she wants to trace backwards from there. And most of those transported were members of United Irishmen, which means there were uh, political reasons for their transportation, that's for sure. Uh, number two, 
Gene Murphy of Cleveland, Ohio. Your passengers, uh, Irish passengers book and County Mayo genealogy uh, book has shipped. Robert Mullen of Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. Your County Dairy genealogy and family history notes shipped. George McDonald of Warner Robins, Georgia. Your County Tyrone genealogy has shipped. Patricia Scott of Bingham, Binghamton, New York. Your County Fermanagh and Louth genealogy has shipped. And welcome Dudley Donahue of Durham, Kansas, a new member. Your families of County Kerry, Ireland has shipped. And uh, he says uh, they're looking at Daniel Donahue, who served in the Union in the Civil War at Point City, Virginia in 1865. And last but not least, member Randy O'Gwen of Alexandria, Virginia, says he can go back on paper six generations to Hardy O'Gwen and uh, various spellings. You know, O'Gwen, I've also seen people interchange that with O'Quinn. That Q is just interchanged with the G. But it goes back six generations to North Carolina in the U.S., uh, back to about 1775, and they say he died in the U.S. in uh, Tennessee after 1850. So I've got the rest of that information on the blog if you want to read more about that uh, family notes. Very interesting. Uh, hey, that reminds me, thanks to each and one of you uh, members and everybody who who pitches in and gets a book, uh, uh because we need your membership that keeps us all going, and I appreciate each and every one. Now it's time we move on to the Irish family name of the day. Well, today we've got the Irish family name of Hennigan or Hennahan, depending on how you end up spelling it or pronouncing it, and it's in honor of member Ann Blackshaw. Now, related spellings of the name, that could be shorted, shortened to just play an old hen, or like I said, hennahan, or hennan, or ohennahan, be a C-H-A-N instead of a G-H-A-N, and uh, hennagain, you can add an E to the end of it. I've got some more variant spellings on the uh, blog if you're interested, and I found it in variant spelling group number 99 in the Master Guide to the Various Spellings of Irish Family Names. Uh, link to that's on the blog each week, of course. Now, if we take a brief, brief look at the uh, notes on the history of the name, you can find it most likely spelled in our uh, records beginning with H-E-N-E, -E, and uh, County Mayo is considered a traditional location for the name. And you're also going to find it in County Galway, where it has even been noted as being translated into the name of Bird. So some of you folks out there named Bird could actually be Hennahan's in disguise. Well, now if we take a quick look at the Irish family coats of arms, we don't see uh, we don't see a match this week on that name. It's just not in there, and that's okay. But we do find here's one shortened spelling, but I don't think it's uh, it's probably not the Irish family of the name. It's the Hen family of Paradise Hill, County Clare, that is found in the. Uh, Irish Book of Arms, and that's that's got to be a name of separate origins. Hey, coming up later, we're going to talk about uh, something called If It Wasn't for the Irish and Jews uh, and uh, Mick Maloney who put that together. Stay tuned. Uh, now we're going to take one last look here at the name. In our free master index search of Irish names, we found uh, listings for the name spelled pretty close to what she's got, and... Uh, 15 times, and here's, well, here's seven of them. We picked out uh, Irish names and surnames by uh, the Reverend Wolf. It's in there. It's in Families of County Cork. It's in the Birth Index of Ireland, in our County Mayo genealogy book, in our Families of Galway uh, book, and, of course, in the names of Irish passengers to Ireland. And uh, O'Hennahan is given in County Mayo genealogy and family history notes. That'll do that. You know what we're going to move on to now? The Websites of the Week. Well, our number one page we picked was the uh, Lisdoon Varna Matchmaking Festival in Clare. And having the O'Loughlin family hail from County Clare, I'm well familiar with that. Uh, so people from all over uh, 
not only Ireland, I think they're shipping them in from uh, the continent and they're even shipping them in from uh, America now and then if you want to find yourself a nice, a nice match to make. Number two, uh, just read for genealogy folks you might know or researchers, Google has tripled the size of the number of and quantity of newspapers you can search and that's that collection starts from gosh at least 1753 onwards so good news for researchers they just keep stacking them up more and more every day you know in the old days the problem was you couldn't find enough resources to search for very long and now the problem is just the opposite number three irish superstitions you'd like to see what they are well they've got a list of them this one person put together and uh Things like only use a found horseshoe for good luck. If somebody gives it to you, it won't work. You know, you have to find it maybe just laying around or you have to dig it up. I don't know. And remember, it's also bad luck to put your shoes on a table or chair. Now, I knew that already because when I was a kid growing up, if I put my shoes on a table or chair, that was real bad luck real quick. Uh, Number four uh, historical maps for Ireland. This, I got a little email on this, and uh, uh, ancestralatlas.com is the place. A link on the blog for all four of these pages. So, I thought you might enjoy that. In addition to that earlier uh, video I mentioned on the uh, Irish coming into Canada, the orphans there. And let me see. It's time. Well, it is. It's time we move to that last section. Everybody's favorite, because it's the last section. I don't know. Curious news and notes. Well, what's your favorite attraction in Ireland? We're going to hear now that uh, the number one attraction that you pay for to get in is Dublin's Guinness Storehouse. And the second one that you pay for to get in is the Dublin Zoo. Now, the third was the Cliffs of Moher. And we, yeah, we've talked about the Cliffs of Moher. That's so popular, it's almost, uh, it's almost too popular. Uh, number two, now, what was the top free attraction? That might surprise a few of you. It's the National Gallery. So uh, if you haven't done that, you better check it out because everybody else seems to think it's a very good thing. Uh, number three, well, the town of Emily in County Tipperary has won the top Tidy Town Award in Ireland. And they beat out both Westport County Mayo and Ennis County Clare by one point. So let me tell you, when you're going for it, don't stop. You might be the winner by just one point. That's a good thing to pass on to the younger generation. Hey, number four, top-selling brand items in Irish shopping baskets. Well, here's the top two. Number one, Coca-Cola. Number two, Avonmore Milk. So Coca-Cola overtook Avonmore milk. You'd think milk would be more of a basic for uh, for basic health, wouldn't you? But I don't know. Maybe they were counting it in different ways. Uh, number five, if it wasn't for the Irish and Jews, that's a tribute to the Irish and Jewish influences on vaudeville and early Tin Pan Alley. And that's by, uh, uh, that was Mick Maloney, I think, and he's a good one. He wrote a... Uh, did a little book on uh, the Irish in, in the old time song in America and uh, recorded an album that came with it on a little disc. So he did some real good work on those early songs. I sure li- I just got through listening to myself. Uh, how'd that one start? Uh, one evening late as I rambled on a clear light la- la- and very interesting. <coughs> <laughs> That's enough of that. But he's got a lot of that stuff, and they've got a. I've got the information on the blog, and uh, he's got. They've got the pricing there and everything else. And I see here they just had it. Uh, I thought it was just the other day. Maybe they're doing a rerun on October twenty fourth at eight p.m. Uh, on twenty five thirty seven Broadway. So uh, hit them, or you can get tickets at uh, symphonyspace dot com. And I've got a phone number on the blog. Got that off the Irish Art Center posting on uh, Twitter. Number six, uh, I just read that relatives of IRA victims went uh, and they're sort of getting together and they want Libya Libya to pay IRA victims, people that were hurt by violence. uh, They want Libya to reimburse the the cost and the damages incurred because Libya helped train and 
did some things with arms and munitions, I think. So uh, now that Libya had that one guy sent back to them, they're saying, well, hey, how about paying up for what you did? I thought that was an interesting uh, insight. I've never heard of anything like that before. Oh, that does it for the day. It's been a good one. We're right to the end of it. And uh, remember to send your comments by clicking on the contact link on our webpage at www.irishroots.com or send by mail to our American address, the Irish Roots Cafe, Box 7575, Kansas City, Missouri, 64116. Leave your message or report on things in your part of the world when you call my phone recorder at 816 816- Two five six three three six zero. Look forward to getting your call. And remember, you can Skype me at the Irish Roots Cafe. Uh, you can reach me on MySpace or Facebook or Twitter. Uh, just about anywhere there is to go, and I'll be glad to talk to you. And uh, and remember, our doors are open to all. But a special thank you to our members who help keep those doors open. And I got to get going now. I'm meeting with Peter tomorrow morning, and we're recording again on our new Irish uh, history question and answer type podcast. So stay tuned for that, too. And away. (laughs) 